In this video, we will be discussing cardiac output and its components. It is essential to understand the concept and the dynamics of cardiac output regardless of the area of your nursing practice, as it provides you with a solid foundation in human anatomy and physiology. With in-depth understanding of the relationship among each component of cardiac output, you will appreciate the effects of various disease processes and interventions that alter the components of cardiac output. Subsequently, you will not only be able to apply an advanced level of critical thinking with a particular disease process, but you will also provide the best possible patient care with an increased level of confidence and advocacy throughout the stage of clinical reasoning, decision making, and clinical interventions. First, let's define what cardiac output is. Cardiac output is simply the amount of blood pumped by the heart per minute. Take a look at the formula. Cardiac output is the product of stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. The normal level of stroke volume is around 60 to 70 milliliters, meaning our heart pumps out 60 to 70 milliliters of blood with each beat or contraction. How does it do this? There are three clinical factors contributing to stroke volume. Preload, afterload, and contractility. Let's break that down. Preload, put simply, is referred to as filling pressures. More precisely, preload is the volume in the ventricle at end diastole, representing the pre-systolic volume available for ejection for the cardiac cycle. The term preload sounds much more complicated than it really is. The heart delivers oxygen and vital nutrients to tissues and organs, arteries deliver blood to the organs, and veins return blood back to the heart. Simply put, preload is the amount of blood that fills the heart before contracting. If a lower amount of blood returns to the heart, it is known as decreased venous return, and this will decrease preload. If you lower venous return, and subsequently reduce the preload, you're going to have a lower stroke volume, assuming other factors of stroke volume haven't changed. What affects venous return? Several factors affect the blood return to the heart, including the total blood volume. Decreases in blood volume can be split into two categories, blood loss and fluid loss. Blood loss can result from internal or external bleeding, vomiting blood, or urination of blood. Fluid loss is similar, but involves the loss of other bodily fluids, such as excessive vomiting, excessive urinating, severe bouts of diarrhea, sweating, burns, and third spacing. Afterload is the pressure required to open the aortic valve allowing for the ejection of blood during a ventricular contraction. One major determinant factor of afterload is systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. SVR refers to the resistance of forward blood flow contributed by all the systemic vasculature, but not including pulmonary vasculature. Although largely determined by changes in diameter of blood vessels, changes in viscosity of blood also affect SVR. For instance, any mechanisms that cause vasoconstriction increase SVR resulting in decrease in forward flow. Any mechanisms that cause vasodilation decrease SVR, resulting in an increase in forward flow. The higher the viscosity of blood, the higher the SVR. The lower the viscosity of blood, the lower the SVR. It's important to note that patients with normal cardiac function can withstand significant increases in SVR without compromising cardiac output. However, patients with heart failure are very sensitive to changes in SVR. This sensitivity to SVR increases with the progression of heart failure. Keep in mind, elevation in SVR is common in heart failure due to persistent neurohormonal activation such as SNS and RAAS. Afterload can therefore be reduced by using therapies that target this system or using direct vasodilators. This reduction in afterload can significantly reduce the amount of work required for the heart to eject blood, therefore increasing cardiac output. Contractility is defined as the inherent ability of the heart muscle to squeeze. Simply put, contractility is a measure of how hard the heart muscle is contracting to pump blood out of the heart. Contractility is based on Frank Starling's law, which states that the greater the stretch, or preload, the greater the squeezing, or contractility. Therefore, increased contractility of the heart leads to increased cardiac output, and decreased contractility of the heart leads to decreased cardiac output, assuming other factors of stroke volume do not change. Let's use the spring analogy to understand this better. 
Whenever we stretch or pull on the spring, it exerts force. The more we stretch the spring, the more force is returned. If we don't stretch the spring as much, it doesn't exert as much force. Similarly, the more the heart fills up with blood, the stronger the force of contraction, and vice versa. If we pull on the spring too much, the spring will break and not function properly. Over time, if the heart muscle is stretched too much, especially in the condition of dilated cardiomyopathies, the heart muscle is not able to contract efficiently, and therefore, law of contraction fails. Therefore, the law of contractility only works as long as there is a healthy balance between stretch and force. We can increase or decrease contractility by manipulating it using certain drugs, such as positive inotropes, like digoxin, or negative inotropes, such as beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and certain antiarrhythmic. Thank you for watching.